all of which I and many of my contemporaries embraced enthusiastically. By the time we filmed The Fishing Party in 1985, I and my colleagues from the city were beginning to reap the rewards of the Thatcher Revolution. Do you think we were foolish to believe that this was a genuinely exciting, groundbreaking time, and that we were at its cutting edge? Well, I mean, I saw it as a journalist, uh, not in the city, but really in politics. And what I saw was a real transformation, probably bigger in the city than anywhere else in Britain, um, from a very old-fashioned institutional framework to something that was really quite sensational. Britain changed. It changed more radically in, in five, six, seven, eight years than it had done so in the previous 20 years. Uh, and the change was one of the breaking apart of institutions, breaking up of, of monopolies, uh, introduction of markets, um, all the things that the, the, the um, free market liberals had always wanted uh, was beginning to happen. And uh, a lot of people were bruised by that. A lot of people didn't like it. And it's this resentment which I and my friends both underestimated and seriously misunderstood. Was it motivated just by envy of our success, or was it what we actually stood for? Well, I think there were two things. One was that people were just jealous, and other people were being very rich. Um, I mean, the difference between the rich and poor widened quite dramatically under Thatcher. Um, and people were making money who, in the views of what might be called the intelligentsia, didn't know how to spend it. Um, they were spending it on the wrong things. But you also have to remember that there were lots of people in the 80s who really suffered. And when people saw the miners or the shipyard workers or whatever it was, clearly losing out, car workers who'd earned quite good sums of money, suddenly becoming um, manual labourers, um, you had a very vivid sense of the differences in society which you hadn't had before. The irony is that 1986, the year the fishing party was shown, heralded the climate of privatisation which remains with us today. It was the start of an era of genuinely popular shareholding, and more people became homeowners in a property boom supported by council house sales. So, 20 years on, when it appears to me that in one way or another, even more people now have a slice of Mrs. Thatcher's legacy, does it seem less fair that my friends and I were turned into scapegoats back then for all that was seen to be wrong with the country? I wanted to ask Paul Watson why he made the film in the way he did then. Did he really hate us personally, or were we just the modus operandi for his own political statement? How did he feel about it now? Sadly, he declined to discuss the film. Byron Rogers, however, did. Looking at it now, I would think, my God, you were stitched up. I mean, you were young, you were successful, but God, you were gullible. You know, if you filmed the London cabbie talking, or... Uh, or a chap in a pub, I mean, the, the opinions are extreme. Nobody else talked. I mean, you talked against a background of bewildered children and submissive wives. Now, this was very cunningly done, because anyone will sound like a bully when everyone else around him is silent. I think it's a very unfair film now. Paul Watson was charming, provocative, extremely disarming, and quite ruthless in his execution of the project and us. Countless hours of film and sound were edited and intercut with news reports to paint a picture of excess, arrogance and decadence. Anything that we said or did that did not fit in the filmmaker's agenda was definitely deleted. I also wonder whether people now recognise that, rightly or wrongly, not everything that we were shown saying in the fishing party was uttered in a spirit of utmost seriousness. There's only two good reasons for getting married. One is to have children. The other one is to say that at least your wife can drive you home when you're drunk. It is possible to be entertained, amused, and not take too seriously um, people who come out with um, what may be outrageous right-wing views, as it seems. You know, they're making sort of in-jokes, really, which we are taking at face value. Now we see it, I think, far more um, for what it is. I also find it amazing that some of the original viewers actually thought the BBC was offering a platform for our views. Didn't they hear how all those radio news clips were used to counterpoint and undermine us? Some food aid is at last getting through to remote areas of Mali, but not enough to go round. Christopher Morris, BBC, Timbuktu. Can I have a crutch pad? God, if somebody went on holiday with me to Tenby and intercut with, you know, some dreadful things happening in the world, we'd all look selfish. You didn't actually need to take... take what I thought was a sledgehammer approach 
um, by using this, uh, these news broadcasts, some of which were relevant, some of which I thought pretty were not relevant. Um, Paul wanted to, and, um, you know, he was the filmmaker. The first time firearms were used by writers. Yeah. Yeah. It's a perfectly legitimate have thing to do, to make a documentary which argues a particular case and uses uh, techniques of this kind. But you should be aware that that's what's happening. Clearly, had we been aware of the real agenda at the time, we might have been a lot less inclined to participate. Are we all just a bit wiser to this kind of thing today? The fishing party is now considered to be a classic of a certain genre of filmmaking and is actually taught to teenage students who weren't even born when it was first shown. And you think it was them that was, were the hypocrites or were they being painted in a bad light? Who, who, who reckons they were stitched up? Um, I guess they have control over what they say and if they didn't want to come across as a certain type of person they wouldn't have said some things they did say. In real life he might actually be like, you know, normal people but I think it's the editing as well that makes him a lot more stupid and... Another thing about the film is it's, it's of its time, it's way before you were born. What was going on at the time and, and how, is it, how is this film commenting on it? Was it during a recession? It is, it's pretty, it's pretty, times are pretty rough, yeah. I think it's hard for young audience to understand what the 80s were like or what the kind of the prevailing social and political realities were over, over a lifetime ago as far as they're concerned. However, I think they do understand the technique. I think people like Michael Moore use this technique all the time, this kind of undercutting and self, you know, the, the ambush, uh, the, uh, you know, pretending that you're uh, on the side of the interviewee but in fact you're not. I think they, uh, they would respect that. Uh, and they, in, in some ways, uh, they expect it, and that's, that's kind of part of the game of the modern documentary. Hello. Hello. Good Hi. morning. That may be so, well. but what I don't see the modern documentary doing is challenging today's establishment and representative figures. The same relish and ruthlessness that the fishing party did against us 20 years ago. You look like a raven-haired temptress in that photo. Oh, well, there you go. Perhaps people are simply too sensible to fall for the same tricks that I did back then. Or maybe it's because the kind of people who resented us so much in the 1980s have now become part of the system themselves. Do you think that uh, the, the, the sort of soft left intellectual who felt so ostracized by Margaret Thatcher in the early 80s, uh, what does he feel today? Does he, does he feel he's got anything to argue about anymore? Has he got any, any, any axe to grind anymore? Has he got anybody to punish anymore? I think Blair's great achievement was to make what happened in the 80s permanent. Uh, whatever it was that Thatcher said, uh, and whatever it was she did, and she said much more than she did, I have to say, um, Blair effectively said there's no alternative. So the, the left has got no, or had no alternative to Thatcherism. It hasn't produced one. It's still pursuing all the Thatcherist um, responses to the public sector and to the private sector, for that matter. Mm. There's been no going back on union reform. None of these things um, have, have, have uh, been realised by the left. Um, I think they've got no arguments, really. I worked near here in those heady days of the early 80s, and looking back, have few regrets. I haven't managed to keep the money, but it was fun. I can't say the same of the fishing party. With the benefit of hindsight, I can see and cringe at the awfulness of the spectacle in which we allowed ourselves to be the principal players. Like performing seals, we leapt and pirouetted to every morsel Paul Watson tossed us. We were young, foolish, opinionated, and should never have done it, but that is no excuse. However, for better or worse, much of what we really stood for then not as we were portrayed, has actually endured. Where are the Paul Watsons of today, I wonder? It is remarkable that many of those who despised what we represented in 1985 have not only endorsed and supported its new Labour legacy, but now drink insatiably from its profitable well and are, unsurprisingly, conspicuous in not condemning it. So nothing really changes. The secret loans given to the Labour Party to help bankroll the last election campaign totaled £13,950,000. Labour will not reveal who gave what, only that future donors will be identified. The party denies that the people who loaned it almost £40 